Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching 1917 Russia's Two Revolutions by Epic History TV. By the way, this is just an updated version of their video on the Russian Revolution, uh, which they released several years ago. This is how we're going to end off our series on Russian history. If you guys have any more suggestions for videos on Russian history, please leave them down below. So, Last time we witnessed the coronation and reign of Nicholas II. Uh, he dealt with the 1905 revolution, and then we got into World War I, which was basically a disaster for Russia, and we sort of ended off with the beginning of Russia's 1917 communist revolution. Uh, of course, as this video suggests, there were two revolutions in 1917. It was an entire revolutionary period, and we're going to get some more detail on that this time. I'm excited to uh, get into that. Uh, but before we do, I would very much appreciate it if you guys would check out the Patreon linked in the description or become a channel member by clicking the join button next to the subscribe button for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump into this reaction. Poor Nicholas. It did not go his way. <laughs> In 1894, Nicholas II became ruler of a Russian empire that mm. stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific. Inhabited by 126 million people from 194 ethnic groups. Wow. It was a country in which workers and peasants lived in poverty and hardship. Yeah. And, of course, it is worth remembering that at this point, um, and even at the time of the Russian Revolution, the vast majority of the population are peasants. Now, Russia does do a lot of industrialization in the decades leading up to the revolution. Um, the working class will grow greatly. That is true. But most Russians are still peasants um, by the time the revolution happens. While Russia's elite its imperial family and aristocracy lived lives of gilded luxury. Russia's very, very slow to modernize. So Russia's elite at this point does include a growing middle class, but the Russian middle class developed a lot more slowly than in, say, Western European countries, just as the Russian working class would develop more slowly than in other European countries. Russia remained an absolutist state with an absolute monarch at its head with a fairly influential aristocracy long after many other European nations had basically dropped those things. There was a long history of struggle in Russia against the injustices of the system. Yeah. And in 1905, a revolution forced the Tsar to allow the creation of a state Duma, or National Assembly. But its power was limited, and the compromise pleased neither the Tsar nor the reformers. Yeah, it had limited power. The Tsar really wasn't willing to give up power to this representative body, and so he basically refused to play ball. He really had no interest in it. He had only granted this Duma in a moment when it looked like his regime might be brought down, he felt desperate, he felt forced. Also, the 1905 revolution, it kind of could have gone the way of the 1917 revolution. Um, you know, you had, of course, a lot of liberals in uprising, but a lot of workers. Um, now, the working class wasn't as developed as it would be 12 years later, but there definitely was a prominent working class in the cities at this point. Uh, and they were already pretty radical. But what happened is that the liberals and the workers sort of failed to get themselves together, uh, sort of similar to the 1848 revolutions. And so in the end, they really didn't get too much from the revolution. Uh, a lot of the revolutionary activity was crushed. The Tsar did grant some concessions, but following 1905, the empire continued relatively as it had been before. Uh, as this absolutist state led by one man, Nicholas, where 
you know, the liberals and their Duma really didn't have too much power. In 1914, this divided empire was plunged into fresh crisis by world war. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. I, I love seeing all of Nicholas's confident quotes. <laughs> Uh, and obviously we all know what would happen. World War I was a disaster for Tsarist Russia. Yeah. At the front, the country suffered a series of devastating defeats. While at home, there were food shortages and economic chaos. The Tsar was held responsible for the crisis. Mm. After all, he, I mean, he was now the army's commander yep. in chief, and he was standing in the way of government reform. Yeah, okay, so this is the point I was going to make. One, Nicholas, you know, put himself into that position. He wants to get out there and lead the army himself, which was a terrible idea because now you're directly responsible. But two, when you're an absolutist monarch, when stuff goes wrong, you know, you're the one to blame, right? Yeah, if you have a democracy, a constitutional monarchy, maybe, you can say, well, my ministers are getting in the way and the government's getting in the way, but... When you're an absolutist monarch, not only that, but you're out there as the commander-in-chief. When everything starts to crumble, people are going to say, well, we hate to say it, but it's got to be Nicholas. <laughs> you know, he's the one doing all of this. And to be fair, people were resistant to saying that for a while. Um, under monarchical systems, there's sort of a common trope of when stuff goes wrong, the people don't want to blame the monarch because they're such an important and revered figure. They want to blame... For example, scheming ministers. In the case of Nicholas, they wanted to blame his wife. They wanted to blame Rasputin. But at the end of the day, one, Rasputin was murdered. Uh, and two, it became very clear that this was on Nicholas. This was his fault. And so he really couldn't avoid the blame that was being passed around. His German-born wife, Empress Alexandra, was even thought to be supporting Germany. Yep. While the entire family was said to have fallen <laughs> under the spell of a Siberian mystic and yep. faith healer. Just as I mentioned them, here we go. His German wife and Rasputin, uh, objects of much scorn and ridicule amongst the Russian people. Grigory Rasputin. And fear, for that matter. In December 1916, Rasputin was murdered by Russian aristocrats. Yep. Possibly with the help of British secret agents. Ooh. Both groups determined to end his influence over the Tsar. But in the eyes of many, the damage had already been done. Yeah, and, and this is what I'm talking about. People wanted to think that it wasn't Nicholas, it was his advisors. It was Rasputin. And so they murdered Rasputin. But it turns out that though Rasputin... You know, was a scheming creep who did a lot of bad stuff and definitely was not a good influence on the royal family. He was not the one calling the shots. You know, uh, it was Nicholas and to some extent his wife. But Rasputin wasn't puppeteering Nicholas and telling him to do this uh, and, you know, starve the people and fight the war badly. Unfortunately, that wasn't him. And so murdering Rasputin isn't really going to do you much good. On the 23rd of February 1917, thousands of women took to the streets of the Russian capital. Here we go. We're getting the first revolution of the year. Uh, also, another note, I feel like uh, in revolutions, it is often women who make the first move or one of the first moves. Um, possibly because, in this case, the men are out fighting war, uh, and the women are the ones having to deal with the home front, deal with their families, who they cannot feed. <laughs> They're starving. And so if they get desperate enough, they'll start marching, get out there in the streets. We saw some similar stuff with the French Revolution early on. Um, of course, both men and women were involved, but women played a really prominent role uh, in marching in the streets demanding food. Uh, so, some similarities there. Petrograd, to mark International Women's Day and protest over bread shortages. Mm. 
The next day, they were joined on the streets by workers and students carrying yep. placards that read, Down with the Tsar. Uh-oh. <laughs> Troops ordered to put down the disorder mutinied and joined the protesters instead. Yeah, and this is when you know you're in trouble. Uh, sort of the, the commonplace piece uh, of advice or wisdom for monarchs who are trying to resist a revolution is, you know, as long as the army's on your side, you can probably put down the revolution. Maybe not. But once the army starts to turn, they start to join the mob, uh, then you're pretty much screwed. Tsarist officials were arrested. Prisons and police stations were attacked. Emblems of Tsarist rule smashed and burned. The government had lost control of the capital. Yep. The Tsar was told by his ministers that order could only be restored and Russia saved from military defeat if he gave up power. So on the 2nd of March, Nicholas agreed to abdicate. Uh, and Nicholas did not want to abdicate, by the way. The first reports he received of the chaos in the capital, he thought, were very much exaggerated. But it quickly, uh, very quickly became clear that stuff was getting out of control. Uh, and when, you know, all of your top generals and ministers and advisors confront you and tell you, look, it's over, even someone like Nicholas, you know, has to admit that it's over. Um, now, Nicholas wasn't the most conservative, extreme monarch of all time. He was more of a sort of moderate conservative type. He was never that decisive, but he definitely wanted to keep the throne. He believed in his God-given right to be the Tsar of Russia. So he did not want to give it up, but he realized at that point that he had to. In just 10 days, 300 years of Romanov rule had come to an end. Remarkable. Ah, <laughs> oh, we're getting to the provisional government. The February Revolution had been remarkably swift and bloodless, and hopes were now high for the creation of a more democratic, more just Russian state. Oh. Members of the State Duma, the National Assembly, had formed a provisional government, which was to hold power until a constituent assembly was elected to give Russia a new constitution. Yeah. But in reality, the provisional government shared power with the Petrograd Soviet, a council elected by workers and soldiers that controlled the capital's troops, transport, and communications. And this, by the way, is what a Soviet is. This is what a Soviet means. It is a workers' council, or in this case, workers and soldiers. And so the provisional government is being established, but at the same time, the workers and soldiers are being organized into these Soviets, and so you have a classic dual-power situation. Uh, the Soviet Union, when it was established, would also have something similar to have a, a dual sort of bureaucracy, um, but they were sort of in concert. You know, you have the party and the government. In this case, you have a dual power system, the Soviet and the provisional government, but they're clashing. They do not get along, and this is going to lead to issues. The Petrograd Soviet, dominated by the Socialist Revolutionary Party and the Marxist Menshevik Party, mm -hmm. was much more radical than the provisional government. And take note of that, dominated by the Mensheviks and the Social Revolutionaries. Um, did you notice what group you didn't hear? The Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were still a relatively minor and unpopular political party at this time. Now, they weren't, like, super tiny. Um, you know, they were definitely notable, but they were not one of the biggest uh, at this point. Yet it supported the government's decision to continue the war and honor the commitments that Russia had made to the Allies. Yeah, and this is really going to be the downfall of the government, but I'll, I'll let it go for a little bit longer before I speak on that. It was a fateful decision Yeah. that ultimately played into the hands of one of the smaller parties. Here we go. The Bolsheviks. Here come the Bolsheviks. And yes, this is how they really distinguished themselves. So the provisional government made the decision that they could not abandon the war effort. They had... Um, 
you know, they had treaties with their allies that they wanted to fulfill. So just like Tsar Nicholas, they continued the war. And of course, they were different than the Tsar. Um, you know, uh, the provisional government was a lot better than the Tsarist government. But the main thing the people had wanted was an end to the war. And, you know, the good stuff that comes with peacetime, like more food. <laughs> That's what they wanted. And the provisional government didn't provide that. And additionally, uh, the Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet, which was the one in control, the main one, agreed, sided with the provisional government. There was one party, uh, a relatively minor but still notable party, the Bolsheviks, who totally disagreed with this effort. They disagreed with the war effort. They wanted to end the war, and they stuck to their guns. Uh, and this would make them far more popular. This would skyrocket their popularity. Um, you know, they still wouldn't become, uh, I think, the most popular amongst their socialist brethren. Uh, the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks remained very popular, but the Bolsheviks would become a much more powerful force than they had been because they were willing to oppose the war, which is what a lot of people wanted. Their leader, Vladimir Lenin, recently returned from 16 years in exile, bitterly opposed the imperialist war. Yes, Lenin had been exiled in Siberia and then exiled to foreign countries in Europe, and he had just recently been sent back by the Germans. They'd paid for his train ticket back to the Soviet Union because they thought he was going to cause chaos, which uh, he did. Um, you know, Lenin was uh, a prominent, the main figure, the leader of the Bolsheviks movement at the time, and he was against World War I from the beginning. Even a lot of socialists had been on board with the war when it had began. You know, a lot of socialists were overcome by nationalistic sentiment. Lenin was an exception. Uh, he was one of the few who had disagreed with the war from the beginning, who had called it basically an imperialist war that it was just using the working class as pawns. Uh, and whether you agree with that perspective or not, you got to admit that at this point, the war was pretty unpopular. So someone like Lenin, who had been opposed to it the whole time, was starting to look a little bit more appealing to people who really wanted the war to be over with. He also demanded the immediate redistribution of land, from rich landowners to peasants. And to be fair, this was something that uh, the social revolutionaries were also really big on the redistribution of land. Um, and I think the Bolsheviks kind of nabbed some of those ideas from then. The social revolutionaries were far more popular amongst the peasantry. But, you know, the Bolsheviks were kind of lining up the dominoes. They wanted to get all the popular positions out there. Like, we support ending the war. Yeah, we support land distribution. You know, everything that everybody likes. And the transfer of power from the bourgeois provisional government yep. to the People's Soviets, or councils, that were springing up across Russia. That's a pretty famous slogan. The Bolshevik program was summed up in a simple slogan. Another very famous slogan. Bread peace and land exactly and what everybody Russia. wanted this is exactly what everybody wanted they wanted bread they wanted food they were starving this is why the protests on the streets began in the first place they wanted peace they wanted the war to end uh they wanted um you know their brothers their husbands uh you know well the soldiers themselves wanted to stop dying out in the field for a war they didn't believe in and land the peasants wanted the redistribution of land. They didn't want to keep working on some rich landowner's land and not earning anything for themselves. Uh, and this is also, this slogan, a good example of how the provisional government had failed to satisfy the people. Now, whether you think the provisional government should have continued the war effort or not, that's not really important. What's important is that the people very much wanted them to, right? And so, uh, particularly as the provisional government continued with the war effort, it really wasn't going super well for them. And so, the people had originally revolted against the Tsar because they wanted bread, peace, and land. Emphasis on the first two. The provisional government had failed to provide those. And so, they were out on the streets again. As economic and military crisis deepened, its appeal to the masses grew and grew. Yep. <laughs> Classic Lenin. <laughs> In June 
A new Russian military offensive ended in disaster. Yeah. 400,000 Russian casualties. And so this is the problem. You have the provisional government led by Kerensky, and not only are they continuing the war, which people don't like, but it's not going well, and that makes it even less popular. Massive desertions, and the collapse of army morale and discipline. In July, soldiers and sailors in Petrograd mutinied. Mm -hmm. they and same thing we talked about with the Tsar. As long as you have the soldiers on your side, perhaps you can squash any sort of popular uprising or popular rebellion. Well, the provisional government is starting to lose the support of the people who they need the most, the soldiers. They were joined in the streets by workers with Bolshevik support. But I mean, you've got... <laughs> probably in Russia at this point, the two most radical and willing to commit violence groups, the workers and the soldiers. I mean, the soldiers have just come back from war, they're armed, they're ready to go, uh, and the workers have become very radicalized, um, working in these factories, striking, marching. These are two groups that if you're organizing, say, I don't know, a revolution, you would very much want to have them on your side. Troops loyal to the provisional government opened fire on the protesters and dispersed the crowds. A police crackdown followed, leading to the arrest of several Bolshevik leaders, mm -hmm. including Leon Trotsky. While Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin, fled to Finland. <laughs> We're seeing some very important figures pop up, Stalin, Trotsky. Lenin manages to escape, um, which is probably good for him. Uh, and Trotsky gets captured, but Trotsky, who we haven't heard about yet, will become very important down the line. And to be fair, he's already a prominent figure. Uh, he started off as a Menshevik, actually, uh, but he will become one of the most important Bolsheviks down the line. Traveling with forged papers under the name of Konstantin Ivanov. Hmm. A socialist and stirring orator named ah. Alexander Kerensky here he is, Kerensky. Became Russia's new prime minister and was hailed as the man who would save Russia from anarchy. <laughs> Lol. Oh, God. The army's commander-in-chief, General Kornilov, believed Russia's war effort was being undermined by chaos at home. Mm -hmm. and del deliberately sabotaged by men like Lenin, whom he declared a German spy. And Kornilov is going to be a big problem. So in August, he ordered his men to march on Petrograd. To ah, here we go. So, Kerensky just absolutely should not have trusted Kornilov. Now, he didn't entirely trust him, but... This was really a bad situation. Kornilov was a conservative, um, you know, and at this point, even the provisional government was liberal to socialist, uh, and the Soviets were socialist to communist. So there wasn't really any room for conservatives or royalists who, like Kornilov, wanted to be done with this whole thing. They wanted to get rid of the, the liberal provisional government and the commie Soviets, uh, and, you know, lead the war effort, you know, tough, like men. Um, so this was going to be a big problem. Of course, clashes were going to emerge, and of course, Kornilov was going to do something like this, which puts Kerensky in a bad spot, and we'll see what happens. To restore order. Bolsheviks played a leading role in the city's defense against this attempted military coup. Right, so... You know, on one hand, I mean, it's good for Kerensky that Kornilov didn't succeed in overthrowing the provisional government, but what's bad is that the communists, and the Bolsheviks in particular, you know, the Bolsheviks who have the workers and the soldiers on their side, the Bolsheviks who are so well-organized and well-armed, they play an important role in defeating Kornilov's attempted coup. And so that just looks even better for the Bolsheviks. And it doesn't really look great for Kerensky. Hey, Kerensky, your government, your commander-in-chief, just attempted to march on the capital, and we were only saved by those Bolsheviks you're so opposed to. Not a great situation if you're Kerensky. 
their most brilliant organizer, yep. Leon Trotsky, was released from prison and sent armed Bolshevik militias, the Red Guards, to defend key points in the city. Yeah, Trotsky, you know, basically a military genius, uh, really got a chance to show it. Uh, and they mentioned another point which is very much worth bringing up, which is that Kerensky, the government, released many of these Bolsheviks, like Trotsky, who they had arrested, to aid in the war effort, or the effort in deterring Kornilov. So, you know, you can sort of see things slipping out of Kerensky's control, though he didn't really have control in the first place. Strikes by railway workers, many of them Bolshevik supporters, prevented Kornilov from moving his men by rail. Mm -hmm. And his soldiers began to switch sides, or <laughs> simply go home. Yeah. The Kornilov affair cast the Bolsheviks as saviors of the revolution. It's just everything that's happening. You know, the Bolsheviks have been opposed to the war from the beginning. They've been capitalizing on this. They managed to defeat Kornilov. It didn't come to an actual armed battle, but through the efforts of the Bolsheviks and others, the Kornilov uh, coup uh, march on the capital was deterred. Uh, he kind of fell apart while it was happening. And so the Bolsheviks are looking better and better and becoming more and more popular. And the provisional government, uh, if its popularity already isn't at, a, you know, a bottom, it's becoming less popular. And by the end of September, they'd gained a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. Yep. In October, Lenin decided the time had come. Now, to be fair, throughout the entire country, the Bolsheviks were not the majority. I think the social revolutionaries and perhaps the Mensheviks even were still more popular. But within the big cities like Petrograd um, in particular, that was the most important city they had become the most important of the socialist factions. He secretly returned from Finland to Petrograd and began preparing to seize power. Hmm. This is a good, very representative quote from Lenin. You know, Lenin, uh, I would say, was very much a sort of means justify the ends kind of guy. Um, you know, he was a great organizer, um, you know, a great speaker. And basically, he felt that he had to do um, whatever he had to do to achieve the revolution, right? To achieve his goals. And so whether that took not waiting for a formal majority, ignoring democracy, uh, and committing some pretty terrible atrocities down the line, uh, of course, this is past the revolution I'm talking about, Lenin does whatever it takes to achieve his goals. That's the kind of guy he is. Uh, now, you know, he's followed by Stalin, who is far, far worse. Um, so that's... Stalin sometimes overshadows Lenin, I think. Um, but Lenin is very much a, a means justify the ends type of guy as well. Um, though, I mean, Stalin was definitely more pointlessly brutal, I'd say. On the 25th of October the Bolsheviks made their move. Red Guards and loyal troops seized key points around the capital. Mm -hmm. And that night, they stormed the provisional government's headquarters at the Winter Palace, an event later immortalized by Bolshevik propaganda and the great Soviet filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein. Yeah. Though to be fair, I, I don't think the Bolshevik revolution, um, you know, this event in itself was actually that bloody because there really wasn't too much resistance to it. We've already talked about how, you know, the momentum was with the Bolsheviks. They had become the most popular socialist faction in Petrograd. They had many of the workers and soldiers on their side. There were not a lot of people left who, you know, wanted to defend the provisional government, particularly with their lives. A lot of people were on board with what the Bolsheviks did, and a lot of people were kind of apathetic at this point. Uh, just another revolution. Well, it's against the provisional government. I don't like the provisional government. So, you know, there wasn't too much resistance to the Bolshevik takeover. Now, in the long run, <laughs> you know, we move into the Civil War. Uh, the first few years of Bolshevik rule will be extraordinarily bloody. There will be tons of resistance and warfare within Russia. But right at this point, they managed to take over pretty easily. K-1 
Kerensky fled the city at the last moment, narrowly avoiding capture. Yes. And the next day at the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, Lenin announced the overthrow of the provisional government. <laughs> well, Lenin definitely does have a knack for quotes, huh? Um, yeah, always a good Lenin quotation. And, you know, to be fair, what I will say uh, about Lenin is that, you know, we have a lot of uh, leftist academics and revolutionaries throughout time who are definitely more uh, bark than bite. A lot of people talking about how the revolution has to do this or that, but wouldn't actually participate. Um, themselves. Lenin, who was, uh, I think, a pretty upper-middle-class to upper-class kind of guy, um, he believed these things, and he went through with them, you know? Uh, he was definitely um, committed to doing what he said. He was not one of these academics who just wanted to write and not achieve. He was willing to get out there and do what it took um, in a really brutal manner. The following months saw the Bolsheviks consolidate their hold on power yeah. while fighting a brutal civil war against counter-revolutionary or white Russian forces. Yeah, the Russian Civil War, it's a whole other topic that I'm less familiar with than uh, the 1917 revolutions, but it was extremely bloody. Um, you know, there were a lot of different forces on both sides. You know, it wasn't just the Bolsheviks versus the whites. Uh, the Reds versus the Whites. It was the Bolsheviks and anarchist groups and other socialists and etc. versus royalists and some liberals and um, foreigners. You know, like uh, there was support given to the anti-Bolshevik forces from a lot of Western countries. And so it was a really messy, destructive, brutal uh, couple of years of war. Who had foreign support. Right. Some whites hoped to put Tsar Nicholas back on the throne. After his abdication, Nicholas and his family had been held under guard at Tsarkoye Selo, outside Petrograd, mm. where they occupied themselves with gardening and other diversions. <laughs> in summer 1917, the family was sent to Tobolsk in Siberia, where they lived under house arrest in the governor's mansion. The following spring, the Bolsheviks had the family moved to Yekaterinburg. I mean, and I think we all kind of know what's coming. Uh, you know, take a note out of the French Revolution's playbook. If you want to have a radical revolution, well, there are some people who have to go, and that's exactly what's going to happen to Nicholas and his family. In July 1918, as white forces approached the city, Bolshevik soldiers gathered the whole family in a cellar. Yeah. The Tsar, his wife, their son Alexei, their four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia, as well as four servants, and executed them all. Brutal stuff. This is brutal stuff. Particularly, I mean, the children, right? Now, you're not really going to catch me feeling too bad for Nicholas. Um, I, I do sometimes feel sorry for him. He was a man pulled in many directions, but... He was also a man who, you know, had done very bad things as the Tsar of Russia. It's kind of unavoidable. Um, but, you know, his family, the children, uh, you know, it's really brutal and, and a very tragic situation for a family to be gunned down like this when, particularly for the kids, you know, what had they done? Nothing. But, of course, from the perspective of the Bolsheviks, it's, uh, it's all business. That's how they're going to see it. They cannot risk one of uh, the Romanovs falling into the hands of the white Russians because then they could perhaps proclaim them the next Tsar of Russia, appoint them to the throne, maybe they'd gain momentum, whatever. That's how the Bolsheviks would have seen it. Of course, it's still a uh, sort of an act of brutality committed. Russia's civil war was one of the 20th century's most devastating events. An estimated two million soldiers lost their lives. I feel like it's kind of a, an event that isn't really talked about enough, along with um, you know, the civil wars in China and all the conflict that was going on uh, in China around before 
uh, and after the Second World War. That's also not talked about. Uh, same with the Russian Civil War. I feel like it really doesn't get the attention it deserves for how monumental it was, how many lives were lost. While a typhus epidemic and famine claimed the lives of a further nine million civilians. Yeah. By the end of 1921, the Bolsheviks had emerged victorious and under Lenin's determined and uncompromising leadership, set about building a new socialist order. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union, created in 1922, emerged as a world superpower following the defeat of Nazi Germany in World yeah. War II. Yeah, I mean, Soviet Union is established. Um, we have the, the early leadership of Lenin, which then we have the struggle for leadership, and Stalin emerges who, like I said, committed a lot of pointless violence, extraordinarily brutal. Um, but the one thing he did do was he defeated the Nazis, um, you know, with uh, immense uh, loss of life from the Soviets uh, and immense uh, manufacturing output from the Soviet Union at this time. Um, you know, and of course that would establish the Soviet Union and, for that matter, the United States as the two great powers of this new bipolar world that we had from Second World War up until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But it would always remain a single party state where all opposition or dissent was ruthlessly suppressed. Yep, and I mean, you know, when Gorbachev allowed dissent and opposition to emerge, what happened? Well, the thing fell apart. <laughs> so it's exactly right. The second you allowed opposition and dissent within the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union completely collapsed, um, which was, I mean, it was a humanitarian disaster for Eastern Europe. Um, life expectancy and standards of living fell across the post-Soviet world, um, you know, and Gorbachev didn't intend to end the Soviet Union, but he started allowing for free speech, organizing amongst the people and the workers, and he just, his hand slipped and whoops, the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, that's just how it goes, I guess. Those brief hopes for Russian democracy that flowered amid the euphoria of the February Revolution were extinguished by the Bolshevik October Revolution. Yeah. And put beyond reach for decades to come. Yeah, and I mean, to be fair, if we look at Russia's democracy, I have a video on the main channel about this, but Russia almost never really had any democracy. I mean, you have the fall of the Soviet Union, and almost instantly we go to a super presidential system um, where Yeltsin sort of rules by decree, and then after him we have Putin, who's even worse. So Russia really has not had any long-term experience with democracy um, outside of a, a few short instances of popular organizing, uh, such as the collapse of the Soviet Union and the very early days of the new Russian Republic. Uh, and yeah, you know, the Bolsheviks had a chance after they took over to be more democratic. I mean, they held elections. Uh, they could have went through with establishing a, you know, democratic government, still socialist, but democratic. I mean, the socialists were the ones mainly getting votes, but... It wasn't all Bolsheviks. The Social Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks also had a lot of support. And clearly, the Bolsheviks, and more importantly, Lenin, who's in control, democracy was not one of the goals he had in mind. Like I said, he was a man who would achieve his goals at the expense of everything else. And Lenin's goals, well, democracy were not amongst them. And so he didn't really care about it. He crushed it. It was getting in his way. Uh, and that's how it goes. And that's how it went, unfortunately. Bridgman Images are the leading supplier of art, culture, and historic images and footage. All right. Repres so I think, you know, this is their sponsor. So, uh, like I said, this video is a remake of one that is very old. But, you know, please go and check it out. It's linked in the description. You can leave them a like, subscribe to uh, Epic History TV, uh, and check out their sponsor and all that good stuff. Um, but uh, we are now done with this video and with the History of Russia series. I had a good time with this one. Um, apologies for making this one uh, exceptionally long. We've turned a 13-minute video into a more than, uh, at least at the moment, 40-minute long reaction. 
Um, that's because of all my yapping, but I feel like I had a lot to add, a lot of thoughts. This is a very interesting topic in my opinion. Um, so is all of Russian history. I've had a lot to add throughout this series. I think Russian history is fascinating. Um, you know, I think the uh, Bolshevik Revolution is a fascinating time. There, there's a lot to study. The Russian Civil War. Um, and if the series continued past that, I would definitely love to watch videos on Soviet history. I think the Soviet Union itself is fascinating. And a lot of Russian history we can see contributes to modern-day Russia. Um and how it's turned out, <laughs> I guess we'll put it that way, how the situation of the people is, how the government's turned out, how someone like Putin is in power and the actions he's taken, you know, history is uh, very relevant to the present day, and that's one of the reasons I, I study it, I think to understand the world as it is today, to understand geopolitics and domestic politics and society and culture, you know, we have to look at history. Uh, and also history is just fun to study for its own sake. So yeah, I had a really good time with this series. Uh, I hope you guys also enjoyed it. If you did, I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, uh, and once again, check out the Patreon or become a channel member. Anyway, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.